So this morning, I want to talk to you about the mystery of the church. And the first thing I want to show you is this little piece of rock here. There's a picture up there on the screens. It's just a little piece of chipped cement on the back. It's cement. It's painted blue here with it looks like a red stripe and it could could be a letter or something. Maybe it was the letter I or part of a W or something else. I don't know. I don't know that part of it, but I do know the rest of the story because a few years ago a relative of mine, a cousin of mine, was living in Germany when the Berlin Wall was torn down. And on the evening of November 9th, 1989, he personally partook in the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. They were handing out hammers on the side, on the side of the streets. Anything you could, crowbars and hammers and sledges and anything. And anybody that passed by was given a hammer to knock out that wall. And he chipped this off the wall. And he assured me that this was authentic, that it was real. He said his, his exact words were, this isn't the junk they sell at the airport to tourists. <laughs> he said, this came off the wall, this is real. And he said that that piece of rock divided a nation of people from 1961 to 1989. And so I keep that in my office at home just to remember him and to remember that wall. And last week in Ephesians chapter 2, we learned of another wall that was broken down almost 2,000 years ago when we learned of the wall that was broken down surrounding the court of the Gentiles. You remember that? There was a temple and then there was the court of the Gentiles and it had a three foot wall around it. And if you dared as a Gentile to go over that wall, to walk over that wall, it was basically at your own risk and you would, you would be killed, you would be executed for doing that. But now because of Christ's burial and death and resurrection, uh, that wall has been torn down, just like this wall has been torn down. And now people can come together again. Now we, you and I, we're all one people under God. We were chosen by God, we were redeemed by Jesus, and we were sealed by the Holy Spirit, and we are heirs to his kingdom. And instead of having a piece of rock to remember that event, what do we have? Bloodstained cross. You see, that's our remembrance of what Jesus did for us. That cross shows us truly how much he loves us and what he was really to give, ready to give for us. And it also talks to us about the spiritual blessings that we have. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 if you have them, and let's look at the mystery of the church. And the first thing I want you to do is just think of a, maybe a group of people, or maybe some relatives, I don't know, a group of people, or maybe a person. But think of some people that you really don't want a lot to do with. You just really don't want to hang around them a lot. They're completely opposite of you. They have a different mindset. They think differently. Um, their understanding of things is different than your understanding of things. If you're for something, they're usually against it. And if you're against it, they're usually for it. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? I can see the heads going like this. We all know them. Now I want you to imagine this. Imagine seeing them and all of those thoughts vanish. All of those thoughts are gone when you see them and you literally run to them and hug them. That's the mystery of the church, isn't it? That's the mystery that Paul is talking about. This is the mystery that we have is what Jesus Christ has done to bring us together. A bunch of ragtag sinners with each different opinions and different outlooks on life and everything else. And so in this chapter, that's what he's talking about, this, minister, this mystery of the church and what Christ has given us here in this room. We're all different. We all have different feelings and different opinions, but here we can come together on one thing. What's that? Jesus, right? Right? God brought Jews and Gentiles together in one in Christ. Now think of that for just a minute. Think of that. Paul tells us that it's plainly obvious that Paul is telling us, he's revealing these mysteries to us. The first mystery we talked about last week was the mystery of fellowship. First of all, we come together in fellowship with other Christians, but then we come together as a church, and that's what we're gonna find now. So we had a mystery of coming together in fellowship, and now today we're gonna to talk about the mystery of coming together as a church. Look at chapter three, verse one. It says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Paul was a prisoner. He was a prisoner when he wrote this letter. And he says, I'm in prison for telling you the same thing that I'm telling you today. 
He's in prison for preaching the same thing that I'm preaching to you today. He wanted to prove to everybody, the Jews and the Gentiles and the whole world, that we could come together as one and live together, that we didn't need that wall in the temple anymore, that we could come together as one people in Christ. And so he brought some converted Jews. Think of that for a minute now. He had some Jewish folks who converted to Christianity. And so he brought them to the temple. And when he brought them to the temple, they went past the wall. And the Jews went ballistic because they didn't realize that they were literally Jews, that they were, they just looked at them as Christians and they looked at them as Gentiles and they went ballistic and they demanded that everybody be put to death. They demanded that all of the people that came with them and Paul himself be put to death. And so a ruckus broke out and the Romans came and they took Paul away. They separated from this crowd that wanted to kill him, put him in like protective custody, I guess we would call it today and started taking him away. And when he got a little bit farther away from the temple, he said, wait, wait, I wanna, I want to, I want to secure my, I want to let you know what I'm, what I'm doing and what's happening. I want to show you that I've done nothing wrong, that these people are actually Jewish Christians and they can go into the temple. They didn't want to hear anything about it and, they, and a whole nother riot broke out to the point where they had to ship Paul to Rome to keep him safe. And that's where we find Paul now in prison in Rome and what does he do? He languishes there. He sits, he does nothing, he cries, he tells them how boo-hoo-hoo, boo-hoo. No. no. Look, at the, look at the verse again. What does it say? For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of who? Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. He's not a prisoner of the Romans. God has put him there. Jesus has put him there. And so he says, you know what? I can't preach and teach, but I can write letters. And this is what he does. And so he's sending this letter now to the people in Ephesus. And so they will know what this fellowship is, what this mystery of the church is. Verse two, he says, if though, if indeed you have heard of the administration of God's grace, which was given to me for you. I'm writing you this letter if you have, and if you understand what it's all about, that I am the manager, he says, I'm the manager, if you will, or the steward of God's grace, that God gave me grace, and now I'm passing this grace on to you through my letter. But you have to understand, he says, that this letter is of God's grace and comes from grace. Then in verse three, he says that by revelation, there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before briefly. So he's saying, I am going to send you the, the grace of the mystery. I'm going to tell you the, the, about this mystery and that's going to be grace unto you. And that mystery comes from Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. And here's what that said last week. It said, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and under earth. New Testament is full of what Paul calls mysteries. It's full of them. And this one, again, is how we can be brought together as one in Christ. And it's very important that we realize that this is possible because if they don't, we won't, we won't apply it to our lives, will we? If we don't realize that we can come together as one in the body of Christ, what's the reason to apply it in our lives? But if we know, we can work on that and, 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 and fall under that umbrella, if you will. So the first mystery was God bringing together you and I in fellowship, the next mystery is to bring us together inside this church. Ephesians 4, 5 says, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to man, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. So these mysteries were not available before Christ, were they? They weren't known to man. This is a completely new thinking to him then, and how blessed are we to have each other? When you stop and think about how blessed are we to have this church, or in any church for that matter, but this particular church is the, is, a, is the local family of Jesus. And how blessed are we to have this, uh, the fellowship that we have, the friendship that we have, the love for each other that we have, the care, everything, the compassion, everything that comes from God is available to us here in this church. And so these were mysteries that weren't known to people in the past. This must have been really strange teaching 2,000 years ago because it was more of a dog-eat-dog dog world, I guess, back then. 
But he's saying now believers in Christ come together as one mind, one body, one spirit, and one agreement, and the wall has been torn down. There is no more wall between us. We are the fruits of his labor, so to speak. We are one in Christ, just like God wanted us to be. Galatians 3.28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek. Paul said this to the Galatians, telling them, this is the way Paul explained it, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no distinction between anybody in this room. I'm Ray, and you're Marty, and you're Gail, and you're so-and-so, and, and that's it. We're just people. We're just brothers and sisters in Christ. No social uh, distinction, no racial distinction, no, no economic, no spiritual distinctions. Um, we're all living in harmony and peace together. Ephesians 3, 6 says, to be specific. Now, he wants to make perfectly clear, so he continues in verse 6. He said, I want to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So who are the Gentiles in this verse? Me and you, right? They're us. They're us. We're those people I mentioned at the beginning here when I said that you don't like. <laughs> That's who we are. We live all together, we live different lifestyles. We have different likes and dislikes, wants and needs, and now we come together. I spoke uh, Wednesday night, I spoke of Abraham and the Jews, and the Jews said uh, uh, that they were children of Abraham. And Jesus said, that's fine, you're children of Abraham, but you're children of Abraham through the blood. But you can't be my heir to be children of Abraham. Anybody can be a child of Abraham. If you want to be an heir to my kingdom, you have to act like Abraham. You have to do what Abraham did to become an heir of my kingdom. And what did Abraham do? He had faith. He believed, right? So that's what he's saying. You might be children. We might have children of blood out here, but they're not children of God's because of their disbelief. Galatians 3, 7, 8 says that he, now this is Paul, he said that he was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the work of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of God. We think Paul, we set Paul up on a pedestal, don't we? We kind of do, we, he was an apostle. He, uh, he wrote ha almost half of the New Testament, perhaps even more than half, depending if he wrote 13 or 14 books. And we put him way up on a pedestal, but what does he say about himself? The least of all saints. Paul had, uh, this is a, a, look at his demeanor. This is not fake humility. This is the way the man felt. This is the way he, he felt in, in light of God's grace. When he compared himself to God and his grace, he humbled himself and especially humbled himself because he was a, what? He was an enemy to Christians. He was an enemy at one time. He stood by and hold coats, coats and clothes for people while they stoned Christians. And now he said, this mystery of the church, it just humbles me greatly. And he realized that no man can choose his own path, no man or woman can choose their own path and become ministers or servants, if you will, of God and Jesus because the calling that we each have comes from God himself. The calling that we have comes from God himself, not from us. Sherry and I were talking about that maybe, I don't know, a week or two ago. Somehow something happened, something came up, and I, she said, you know, I can see how we got here looking back 30 years ago. Right, you've done the same thing too. And I said, yes, you know what, I think my, I could have done this and I could have done this and if I had done this and gone this route, and I had, this route was wide open, I could have taken that job and that position and I could have moved someplace else, I never would have been here and that would have been it, but that job fell through and I got a job here. You and you never know. But that's what he's saying, I'm just humbled by having God in my life and the way he has led me and the way I, I, just, I just follow. In God's light and in God's righteousness, he's not only a saint, but he's the lowest of all saints. Barry, what did you say? He, Paul said he, his eye was, I'm the, I was a... I'm a sinner, I'm a great sinner, I'm the chief of sinners. He called himself, he said, I'm a sinner, I'm a great sinner, I'm the chief of sinners. So when you can understand that we're all the chief of sinners, we'll be like that. Look at verse 8 again. It says, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches 
of God. And in verse 9, he preaches to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is, what for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. The mystery, I, I love to study the Bible. I could open up my Bible and, and start, I love to study, I love to read. Um, I could open up my Bible and not come up for air forever. I mean, literally, I just love to read the Bible. If something always pops up and I always learn something from I read it. Um, but I would still only scratch the surface of God, right? It would, because he's unfathomable. I'll never have the knowledge of God that I would like to have because he's limitless. I, I just don't have the capability to do that. But Paul struggles with this limited knowledge too. He understands the same thing, that no matter what we do, we'll never fully understand. I think we'll have the word of God when we're in heaven. He said, this will never, this will last forever. My word will last forever. I believe that we can be studying it and reading it in heaven and still learning things and still never understand it completely because he is limitless. But he says this in Ephesians 3.10, he says, I do this so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. See that? To the who? To the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Who are the rulers and authorities in heavenly places? Principalities they've been called. Who would that be? Angels. The angels. Check it out, right? Anyone here want to be a Sunday school teacher or a teacher of the Bible? Because you are. Guess what? You're teaching angels right now. Everybody in this room is a teacher to angels according to this verse. It's all being done through the church and through the church so that the authorities in heaven will know God's plan too. You see, what we do here is very strange to them. It's very strange to them because they've never received what? God's grace. They never fell. The angels who did fall are someplace else, but the angels who are in heaven have never fallen. And now they're looking down at us and going, they're a sinner, 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 they're a sinner. but he loves them. How's that to be? The last time the angels sinned, we know where they went, but not them. They get a second chance. You see? And they've never experienced it. Remember Jesus, we spoke a couple weeks ago around Easter, I think it was, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane crying that night, tears, uh, sweating blood out of his, not crying, sweating blood out of his head, tears out of his head, if you will, the blood. Why was he, why was he sweating blood? Because he had never experienced what was coming up. And it wasn't, well, his death, people are ready to die for people on every single day. I'm ready to die for any one of you, any time. So he wasn't afraid of that. What he was afraid of was what he had never experienced before, and what he had never experienced before was the Father and the Holy Spirit turning their back on him. What's this going to be like? Father, please, if you can take this cup away from me, please take it away. But they didn't, of course. And the angels are the same way. They've never experienced God's grace, and so we're teaching it to them, and I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. Whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose. This is in accordance with God's plan. He's doing all of this. He's teaching this to us. Paul is telling us in accordance to God's plan. That will, that will complete. This completes his plan. Someday we'll fulfill the supreme purpose of the church. What's the supreme purpose of the church? To glorify God. That's it. That's, all, that's what we're here for, to glorify our Lord and Savior. And that includes displaying the grace and the mercy that he has shown us to who? People on the outside, yeah. right? If you go outside and people see Jesus in you or they see God in you, then you have displayed his grace and his glory to those outside. Paul tells us in verse 13, he says, Therefore I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulations on your behalf since they are your glory. Don't feel sorry for me, he says. I'm in prison, but I'm in prison for Christ. I can work from here just as well as I can work down the street. Go ahead, I'm fine in all things because in all things we'll be in him one day and I will be in him too. So don't let this bother you a bit. If I die here in prison, I die. Just enjoy my letters and follow what I'm telling you. So let me end the... Um, same way Paul did, I'll end with his prayer. Up until this part of Galatians, he's telling us what I just told you, but now he prays about it. When Paul prays, he writes it down. So when you, there's two prayers in the book of Ephesians, and this is one of them. And I'm not gonna go through the whole prayer for you, I don't have time, but this afternoon, maybe you can go home 
And in light of what I just told you, he prays to God. And so if you read that prayer now, you'll understand it a little more. But this is what he does say. He says this in verse 14, 15. He says, For this reason I bend my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So he's on bended knee, but not just physically, he's also spiritually, which means he's in an attitude of submission and is willing to follow God's will. When we pray, that's one of the things that we should do too, too is come to him in this attitude of su submission, willing to do his will. That, verse 16, he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the spirit in the inner self. Strengthened with his power. He gives us the power to fight off spiritual warfare. He gives us the power to fight off the bad principalities that are here and not up here. And in verse 17, 19, he asks for strength from them. It says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Now listen to this. This is so we can comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Man, if we could only do that, if we could only come to terms with the width and the height and the length and the breadth of his love, what, what a difference that would make. His love will never understand it. He's 100% love. We just have a shadow of love. But imagine that if we could, if it was possible to comprehend it. And he closes with verses 20, 21, and here's what he says. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. So the mystery of the church is that we can all come together as one one people of one accord, of one mind, of one body, of one soul, and one spirit. And there's no more walls like this. There's no more walls to divide us. The walls have been broken down and torn down. We are free of any barrier that keeps us from Him. And so my message this morning would be, do you know Jesus? Do you love His hope? Do you love Him? Do you love Him and the hope He offers? Do you love Him and the peace that He can give to you? Or are you a stranger? God loves you. He wants to live inside of you. And if you don't know him, today would be a great day to get to know him. And so let's do this this morning. As we close, when we sing our final song and you stand, come forward and say the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. And confess and repent of your sins and walk out of here saved. Walk out of here knowing this love and understanding these mysteries. Um, I know once you understand them, your life will change. If you are in need of prayer, come forward this morning. We have folks that need prayer. Uh, we are told in the Bible to lay our hands on them and just pray for them. There's no power in these hands, but there is power in the hands of the Lord. And so we'll just anoint you with oil and just pray for you. Or if you'd like to be a member of our church, all you need to do is be an immersed believer and come forward and say the good confession. Um, and don't forget, too, that my pool is warming up. And I think within the next week or two, we'll have a bunch of three or four that I know of, at least, baptism. So uh, please stand this morning as I pray and we say our last song.